Day zero is the moment before company formation. When a founder decides to take the plunge, follow their dream, and commit to pursuing their vision of change. On day zero, you'll hear founders tell their story. From the initial idea, through reactions by critics and skeptics, setbacks and successes, we'll cover it all. Behind every company is a founder with ambition, goals, dreams, and wisdom to be shared. Let's explore them together. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm Marcus Osborne with uh, Walmart uh, Health and Wellness, and um, uh, it's my pleasure to be here today. I'm also uh, part of the advisory group and get the honor of interviewing um, uh, a number of great founders and innovators um, in the space. And so it's my honor today to uh, be able to uh, interview Brandon Weber uh, and with, with, with NAVA. So, Brandon, I appreciate you agreeing to do this. If you, if you haven't heard already, uh, I'm a novice uh, uh, or, or even worse when it comes to sort of doing interviews. So this is this has been a fun journey for, for some of the rest of the crew, but I appreciate you taking the time to, to do this today. Happy to. Happy to be here, Marcus. You founded NAVA. What, what is it that actually NAVA does? What is, what is NAVA about? So NAVA is a technology-enabled benefits brokerage company. Um, and why that's interesting is in trying to understand what is driving the spiraling cost in healthcare, uh, what we, we stumbled on and kind of realized is that the benefits broker is acting as the intermediary, the middleman, uh, kind of the gatekeeper between millions of employers and the employees that, that they have and, and, and their healthcare needs and the entire supply side of the healthcare marketplace from cool digital health vendors to really interesting unbundled insurance arrangements and all sorts of neat stuff. And as we explored that benefits brokerage industry, and try to understand, well, how's the status quo going? Because it feels like there's a real bottleneck here. Um, we saw an industry that hadn't evolved in decades um, and frankly, hadn't moved forward and evolved with the with the needs of employers, their employees, and I think the massive increase in complexity in healthcare and benefits. Um, there's an explosion of benefits vendors and and options and um, and, and complexity in, in, in the overall healthcare marketplace. And so what NAVA is doing is we're bringing together technology that enables our benefits brokers, consultants, and our clients, HR leaders, to more easily understand what options they have in the marketplace on the on the on the vendor side. Um, and we're deploying kind of what we think of as the Fortune 500 playbook for benefits to small and medium-sized employers, giving them access to the 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 tools, the technology, and the strategies that America's largest employers have used for years to spend 25% less on healthcare and provide their employees with vastly better experiences. Um, so those two, those two elements combined are kind of what we're bringing together in our, in our benefits brokerage offering. And we're focused first on the employers that we feel are most underserved by the traditional benefits brokerage industry, which are employers that kind of sit between the 50 employees to about a thousand employees range. Uh, where they're big enough to have some real needs and there's real complexity there in their populations, um, but they don't get access to kind of any of this innovation and and support. Um, and so we've been we've been at it for just over two and a half years, and we've got a tiger by the tail. I think that it, it turns out there's like a real pain point and a real need there uh, for these employers, and there's also a real need and pain point from the vendor side, um, looking at Navas, going, you can be my partner to get this innovation in. Uh, into these employers in ways that I haven't been able to do um, kind of in the previous regime. Usually what I have found is this, that if you really want to understand what, why somebody's doing something, uh, if you want to understand what it takes to kind of convince them to do something, you have to first start with their underlying motivations. What, what, what sort of motivates them um, in life? What is your motivation or what motivates you and to do everything? I mean, not just even with a business you're in. I'm interested in just kind of what's in your, what's your motivation? Broadly speaking, I want to make a difference. I really genuinely just get, I get excited about solving problems that people that I know and people kind of in my community have. Um, I think. I think what what ended up moving me kind of out of the you know out of the like 
job path and into the founder path was that I have a tendency to get obsessed with problems that I see. Um, and that obsession really just sticks in my head and I just kind of can't get away from it. And um, in my last business, uh, BTS, it was an obsession with just kind of how crappy and unsophisticated um, the tools being used in the commercial real estate marketplace were. And, uh, and as hard as I tried, I couldn't get out of my head that that marketplace was going to modernize and that, um, and that someone had to go do that work. And, uh, it might as well be me. I was, you know, I was kind of experienced in that, you know, in that industry. And, um, and so for me, I think I, I, that's how I feel with healthcare. I'm, I'm, I am obsessed with this, with this problem in healthcare that we're tackling. And I, I kind of just can't get it, can't get it out of my head. And I get super excited about the thought when I was, you know, when I was kind of thinking about my next chapter, you know, after, after founding my first company, um, I get really excited about just the idea of, um, of doing good and doing well. I think we're sitting here in a time where, we are surrounded by just absolutely massive societal problems, like just massive challenges uh, facing us in education, climate change, healthcare, um, and 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 also this opportunity to go build companies from scratch and and massive amounts of resources to go support us doing that. And um, and for me, I just I feel like if you if you're entrepreneurial at all, if you have a, if you have an entrepreneurial bone in your body. This is one of the most amazing times to be an entrepreneur uh, because there are these huge problems that we genuinely just need as many smart people as we can leaning all in on trying to solve them. And we have an amazing set of resources, both technical and capital resources to go solve those things. Um, and so, you know, I'm the, the kind of do good and do well coupled with, with this unique time in, in the marketplace, I think that, that motivates me like every single day to just go, let's go make a difference. Let's go like really lean into, you know, to these big problems that are facing us. Um, and, and we just have to get solved. I actually love that idea of the obsession, right? And you got to love the healthcare industry. Uh, the healthcare industry is the only one that can take something that, that maybe isn't as a positive and turn it into something that should be treated, right? So we, there, are, there are drugs for people who have, uh, uh, who, who have tendencies towards obsession, but is running your own company something that you view as therapeutic? I have this experience with a lot of founders that I know. Um, for someone who gets truly obsessed about a problem and that there there is a better way, and until that better way is like broadly deployed and out there in the marketplace, um, they can't really sleep very well at night. I think that's I think it's absolutely true. It's you know the the for me the act of going and um, and trying to like be that solution is the therapy. It's therapeutic. You're like, I'm, I'm doing, I'm doing some work. I'm taking a step um, toward solving this problem that I've gotten really obsessed about. And, and I think what I found is it was the, the most efficient way for me to scratch that itch for me to, you know, for me to go and tackle that problem was to build my own company, uh, was to, you know, start a startup that was, it was oriented completely around that it was kind of the most, you know, maybe the most direct path to saying, I am tackling this problem that I can't get out of my head that I lose sleep around, um, you know, at night. And I think that's something that you see with a lot of founders. This is the lever that, that feels like the most effective to pull, um, in terms of building companies, um, oriented around a the problem they, they can't get out of their head. When I see people who are creating something new or going after a new opportunity, it doesn't necessarily even mean founding a company per se, but, but it could be in founding a company or a, a, that, that it's often sort of built around this concept of, of the thesis that we all operate with this thesis or set of theses that, that are kind of the originating force that drive threat change or transformation. And, and you see it, you see it in, in the course of history. What is the thesis? or set of theses that you started with that have driven you to found the company, to continue to operate the company? What, what, what is that sort of thesis or set of theses that, that are kind of moving you? What we observed while we were doing our walkabout through healthcare, just basically trying to answer the simple question, why is healthcare the only marketplace that can deliver 10 to 15% cost increases and a worsening product and user experience. Right? It's just like it defies the logic of most kind of major marketplaces. And I think 
what we observed was um, that contrary to maybe our going in assumptions, there was an absolute combinatorial explosion of, of innovation happening in healthcare, in the supply side of healthcare. And we, you know, we're talking to digital health entrepreneurs under kind of every slice of care delivery, doing amazing things, like really cool cutting edge stuff that we as healthcare consumers have never kind of gotten access to. Um, and it was kind of any direction you go, you'd see this kind of same dynamic of, oh my gosh, there's an explosion of innovation here, but that innovation is not making its way into the hands of the buyer. So kind of the thesis that emerged out of this observation that like, wow, oh my gosh, there's so much cool stuff happening here. The future might already be here. It's just not evenly distributed, um, led to kind of, I think our core thesis that the bottleneck to dramatically improving the healthcare marketplace and making it more consumer and buyer centric, there's not a lack of innovation on the supply side. Not uh, we're, we're missing great point solutions. We're missing, you know, a, a better alternative to the, you know, the, the traditional insurance model. It's a gummed up distribution layer. It's a, it's a gummed up marketplace layer um, that, you know, that is, that is the bottleneck. Um, and that really drove us. And we, and, and we observed that, um, with when we talk to the innovators and we ask them, you know, how how do you get your product into the hands of, you know, buyers in America? And they were deeply frustrated with how difficult it was to go to market to bring their product into the hands of the average employer with the average employee around the country. And so we were like, wow, that's really interesting. We need to understand the distribution channel that is governing the kind of connection between all these suppliers that are doing really cool things and all the buyers that seem to not be getting any access to them or being able to deploy them in their population. And it turns out, well, who governs the largest marketplace in healthcare, which is the employer sponsored marketplace, about 150 million Americans. Well, it's this, it's this industry that not many VCs really talk about, which is the benefits brokerage industry. And they function as the gatekeeper and the essentially the de facto marketplace layer sitting between all of those cool vendors that are doing really neat stuff that have raised a bunch of money um, and, you know, the employers who are trying to provide you know, sponsored health care and benefits for their employees. So that was one of that was kind of one of the big things. We're like, wow, we've got to like adding another point solution to the mix on the supply side is not going to solve this problem. We have to ungun the bottleneck that is that is sitting between them and the, you know, tens of millions of people who are who are working for small, and medium sized employers. The other one, uh, which is what led me to meet you, actually, was that when we actually looked at the employer-sponsored healthcare marketplace, we saw this like story of two totally different paradigms happening kind of at once. It was a tale of two, uh, you know, kind of two outcomes. One was most small and medium-sized employers getting absolutely crushed by spiraling healthcare costs and just degrading products for their employees. Deductibles going up 50% more than... Um, uh, than salaries, um, premiums going up 150% more than salaries in the same period of time. And so those SMBs and mid-market employers were just getting absolutely crushed by the healthcare system. And then we went and started to talk to America's largest employers like Walmart and Amazon and Google and Comcast. And they were playing an entirely different game. And they were bringing in-house the capabilities, tools, technologies, the innovation that we kind of discovered that wasn't making its way into small, medium-sized employers and getting entirely different results too. 25, 30% less in healthcare spend, um, better employee outcomes, better employee user experience. So we, the kind of second thesis was like, gosh, we have to go figure out what America's kind of Fortune 500 largest employers are doing and, and turn that into a playbook. Bring that playbook, those tools, those technologies, um, the access points that they have down to the mid-market at scale. How might we do that? Uh, and so those are the two things that really kind of govern everything that we're doing, which is like, we need to create a better go-to-market channel for all this amazing innovation that's not making its way into the hands of the buyer. And, and on the reverse side, help the buyer do better discovery and learn about those different things. And then two, we're replicating much of the kind of magic that the Fortune 500 have been doing inside of their organizations um, and productizing that and bringing that down to small and medium-sized employers around the country. It's interesting the process that you went through to develop NAVA and those theses. It's it's way more iterative 
hey, we're, we're exploring, we're going to learn, and we think we think X, but actually X isn't the opportunity, Y is the opportunity. And there's a little bit of this paradox that people will tell you, you need to, you know, it, they'll talk a lot about stick to itness, you know, sticking to it and just fighting through. But I also increasingly hear stories over and over where I think founders and innovators and entrepreneurs are actually having to be way more pragmatic. And how do you think about entrepreneurship, it, it, given that sort of, you know, sometimes the lens or the, the ways in which it's portrayed? As an entrepreneur who's, you know, who, who's founded a company and is now founding another company in two totally different industries. One was commercial real estate. Now I'm in healthcare. Um, I think they're one of the things that I've learned is you, there are certain things that you need to have deep conviction over and, and really unwavering conviction over. Um, and for me, that's the, that's the kind of core problem. Like the, the problem, like the fundamental problem, you need to, you need to understand it. You need to see it in three dimensions. You need to have like poked on that and just really truly believe that that is a, that is a fundamental problem that I am not that I, I have I have conviction and I, I am not uncertain about that problem existing. And if we could dramatically improve, you know, the you kind of the, the status quo of that problem or solve that problem, it will create a massive amount of value for our market and our customer. That is where I think you need to have a lot of conviction. The how, the like solution or set of solutions that you build to go and address that core problem, that's where I think you need to have strong beliefs loosely held. And I, I both experienced it for, like personally as a founder, uh, when I haven't listened to the data, I haven't listened to the user and I've just doubled down on my conviction around this is the exact solution, uh, without listening to that data and getting punched in the face as a result of doing that and the market, you know, the market correcting me. Um, so I think that's maybe the, like kind of my first crack at that, which is like deep conviction on, on the problem that you want to solve and who you want to solve it for. Um, and really, I think kind of the corollary to that is like deep conviction on just your why. Like, why do you exist? Why is this organization getting built? Um, I, it's been so fun to build Nava because we have such conviction around our why. Like, we are one of those audacious, like, mission-oriented companies that wakes up every single day and, like, and says, we're here to fix healthcare. And we're doing it by building a better marketplace to connect all those amazing innovators to all the, you know, the buyers that need access to that. And we're going to do it with technology and data and transparency. That is an incredibly motivating thing for us. And I think that's, that's probably the other thing that, that, that kind of we're unwavering about and our products and our solutions could change dramatically. But every single day we're going to wake up and we're, we're going to say we're here to fix healthcare. Um, and we're going to try to do it through distribution. I'm going to put a pin in that. I think that's actually brilliant. I mean, I think if I were, I would steal from you. And, and if there was somebody who was talking about founding, I love that sort of idea of deep, have deep conviction around the problem, but, but be open and pragmatic around the solution and be open to change. And I think that's that, that in my mind is the very essence of being a great entrepreneur and being a great innovator. You know, you founded a company uh, and very successful and, and that was focused on commercial real estate. Um, I actually think there's a lot of people who are innovative, who are entrepreneurial in nature, who are solving problems in other industries that often healthcare is very insular, right? Where it says, if you're not from the healthcare industry, you shouldn't come into this space. And so it's not a very inviting industry in my mind. Um, and, but, but I also am a believer that people need to, uh, that there's a huge benefit, uh, to, to bringing in that experience from outside, given that the healthcare industry is insular, that it's got a bunch of, that's not always fun. Um, that's got a bunch of, you know, that's got, got a, some deep kind of barriers and issues that you got to deal with. What caused you to say, yep, I'm going to make this leap. One of the biggest things I'm passionate about is trying to convince founders to get into the healthcare, the climate change, the education business, to try to just lean in, use their skills, their superpowers, their resources toward fixing some of the just really big, hairy problems that we've got um, as a society. And I think for me, the start was um, when I, you know, I just, I, I had the opportunity to sit back, you know, after, after stepping away from day-to-day -day duties at BTS, and we've been super fortunate to be at the right place at the right time build a company that ended up being kind of the market leader in its space. And I think the first thing that I just wrote down, I just, when I thought about what do I want to do next with, with my life, I knew how to, 
ton of gas in the tank and I, I want to lean in on a big meaty problem was I just want to do good. I want to work on something that matters to my family, my friends, my grandkids. And, you know, I'm sitting in a, you know, 2019 where, where it just feels like there's no shortage of like, you know, dumpster fire types of problems. And for me, healthcare, I, as I, as I got deeper into, I, I come from a blue collar family where I'm probably, you know, one degree of separation away from lots and lots of people that have had a massive healthcare event that has changed their life, like significantly, um, mostly for the worse, um, financially or health wise. As I went down the rabbit hole of just reading about the healthcare marketplace and just why are we in this, this kind of this state that I, that I described earlier, I just became obsessed with this point of view that we are on a runaway train right now um, and we have less than a decade to go turn this around. And if we don't, we ha we will face like significant financial stress and duress at the family level and at the national kind of federal level. Um, and I, I just, for me, healthcare is so it's both a huge marketplace problem and my background is kind of in these brokered marketplaces. I get really interested in the intersection of brokered industries and technology, but the human element of it, I remember one thing that really, that really moved me was as I was doing research, I, I went deep into these Reddit, uh, subreddit uh, message boards. And so you can go into Reddit and you can you can go into personal debt and you can go to medical debt and you can just read stories of like normal Americans who are just trying to navigate the system and trying to get their families out of, you know, medical bankruptcy and whatnot. And I mean, I'd finish those and I'd be like crying. <laughs> and it just it, it just it just became so human to me, too. And so those are the two you know, those are the two kind of things that just motivated me to say, I'm, I'm all in on this problem. This is a problem that we must make significant progress on in the next decade. Um, it's ruining families. Um, you know, one in five Americans has medical debt and collections. I mean, it's just, it's insane. And, um, and so that, that really became my motivation. I was just like, I, I don't yet know what the solution is. Nava had not been created. We didn't have the name yet, but I'm all in on just Growing my resources, my skill set, my expertise at trying to be helpful, trying to be useful in making the healthcare marketplace just more fair and more, you know, more friendly to the folks who are who are in it. Well, I think that's I think honestly that's probably a beautiful way to mm -hmm. to, to end it. First, Brandon, let me let me let me thank you for agreeing to take the time to do the interview. But I but I wanna echo I think what you just said. And I think if there was a message that I could give to uh, individuals is that I hope there are others that are out there that that um, that have said, well, maybe they don't even work in the healthcare industry, but um, but know that there are examples of people like you, uh, bright, talented people who want to bring, who are committed and passionate, and want to bring that passion to addressing the fundamental challenges of the system, and and that I think your point was a great one, which is this isn't this isn't sort of uh, an esoteric conversation. You pull anybody off the street, you know, your mom, your dad, your brother, your sister, your neighbors, you know, it, just or a random person. And they're going to you're going to hear these stories. And I hope people will uh, benefit from your story and 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 understand that uh, there are opportunities for everybody to come into this industry and drive impact. So thank you for everything you're doing. Thanks again for taking the time to chat today and good luck in what you're doing. Thank you, sir. Yeah, so fun to be with you.